Monday was uh, Veterans Day. And I wanted to take a moment as we begin our service to say thank you to the men and women who may be with us today, as well as those around the country who have served us so well to secure and maintain the freedom that we enjoy in this beautiful country of ours. So if you served in the armed, ser armed forces, would you please stand so we can acknowledge you? Father, thank you for these men and the men and women around our country who have sacrificed. Some took time away from school. Some took time away from family and missed the growing up years of some of their children. Some lost limbs and some lost other faculties. Some even made the ultimate sacrifice. And for them, we say thank you, Father. Father, I pray that, that you would enable us to never forget the freedom that we enjoy because of the sacrifices they made. It just reminds us and illustrates the freedom that we can enjoy because of the sacrifice Jesus made for us. Taking our sins on himself when he hung on the cross and died in our place so that we could come to know you in a personal way through faith in his sacrificial death. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship freely this morning. Be with us right now. Help us to, to imbibe from your word. Allow us to, to be impacted. Let your spirit move inside each and every one of us enliven your truth to us this morning and help us to understand what it is you want to say to us, to touch us in, in the unique place that each of us comes into this room needing to be touched. We love you and we honor you right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 91-year-old Martin Greenfield has become known as America's greatest living tailor. He's also a Holocaust survivor. He wrote a book called The Measure of a Man, From Auschwitz Survivor to President's Tailor. And in that book, he tells a story of himself as a 15-year-old teenager being deported from Czechoslovakia to Auschwitz. And in his journey he came face to face with Dr. Joseph Mengele, the infamous doctor of death at Birkenau in Auschwitz. He had a stint at Buchenwald as well, and while he was at Buchenwald, Greenfield was put with a 12-person team dispatched to perform repairs in the nearby town of Weimar. He was assessing damage to a house when he noticed that the cellar door was ajar. I'll let him pick the story up. I slowly opened it. A shaft of sunlight filled the dank cellar. On one side of the space sat a wooden cage wrapped in chicken wire. I walked closer, and I noticed two quivering rabbits inside the cage. They're still alive, I said with surprise. Inside the cage were the remains of the rabbit's dinner. I unlatched the door, and I reached in, and I picked up a withered, browning piece of lettuce and I devoured it. I reached in and I picked up the nub of a carrot and attempted with my teeth to crack it in half so I could eat it. I was overjoyed. My joy was short-lived, though, because from behind me I heard, What are you doing? I whipped my head around and I saw a gorgeous, smartly-dressed blonde woman holding a baby as she stood silhouetted in the doorframe. It was the mayor of Waymer's wife. I, I, I found your rabbits, I stammered with a cheerful nervousness. They're alive and safe. Why in the... I won't say the word. Are you stealing my rabbits' foods? You're animals. I stood silent and I stared at the, store, at the floor. 
I'm reporting this immediately. And she stormed out. He waited for the inevitable. And knowing what was coming made the anticipation all the worse. Down on the ground, fast, dog, yelled the German. He gripped his baton and bludgeoned my back. I don't know whether the mayor's wife watched the beating. Given her cruelty, I can't imagine that she would miss him. On the hike back to Buchenwald, I replayed the scene over and over in my mind. How could a woman carrying her own child find a walking skeleton, saving her pets, and have him beaten for nibbling on rotten animal food? In that moment, my numbness to death melted. In its place rose an alien bloodlust, a hunger for vengeance unlike any I had ever known. The surge of adrenaline and rush of rage felt good inside my withered frame. Then and there I vowed to myself, if I survive Buchenwald, I will return and I will kill the mayor's wife. On April 11, 1945, at 3.15 p.m. in the afternoon, the Allies liberated Buchenwald. He continues his story. He says, physically, I was free. Emotionally, I was in chains. I had made a vow to myself that I would fulfill. Killing the mayor's wife could not repay the Nazis for the terror they had inflicted on us, but it would be a good start. He found two young Jewish boys who had enough strength to go with him, and they made the journey back to Weimar. He had a hard time locating the house, but eventually they found him. And then he says, We crept up the side door, up to the side door. I slowly turned the knob. It was unlocked. I entered the house quietly with my gun drawn. The boys fell in behind me and eased the door shut. We stepped softly to mute the sound of our wooden clogs on the floor. Hello? A voice around a corner said, Hello? Just then, the beautiful blonde woman turned the corner and let out a screech. She had the same baby in her arms. Don't shoot, she screamed. Don't shoot. You remember me, I yelled. Do you? You had me beaten because of your rabbits. I'm here to shoot you, I said, sounding like an SS officer. No, please, she quavered. The baby, please. I aimed my machine gun at her chest. The baby wailed. My finger hovered above the trigger. Shoot her, one of the boys said. Shoot her. The woman's outstretched hand trembled in the air. My heart pounded against my chest like a hammer. Shoot her, the other boy yelled. That's why we came here. Do it. The mayor's wife had been the reason Martin had suffered a humiliating and undeserved beating. She represented the Nazi regime that had killed his entire family. He transferred all of his humiliation, all of his pent-up rage to her. And honestly, nobody would have faulted him from taking a little bit of just sweet revenge. But when God intervenes, he knocks us off center. He wakes us out of our stupor. And he says, you can do that. But I have a better way. And if we will listen to his voice, he will interrupt our righteous indignation. Because at a moment like that, he says something like this to us. Above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Maybe you've been wronged. Maybe you've been hurt deeply by somebody. Maybe you've been dealt a hand that is painful in life. And there's not necessarily somebody you can point your finger at, maybe just God. 
And we can revel in that pain or we can listen to God's voice because God has a better way. And He would say to us, above all else, guard your heart. Because out of it is the wellspring of life. We left chapter 19 last week with a personal challenge. The challenge was, as we entered into the week, don't just live your life, look at your life. Pay attention, surrender it to God, and ask Him to evaluate you as you go through your week. Here's a way that, that David did it in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I invited us all, myself included, to wrestle with God. But there was a warning that I included. When we wrestle well with God, we need to understand that God will often hurt us. And he will hurt us deeply. But he will do that so that he can heal us completely. Set us free. So that we as wounded healers can go out into a world that's broken. And desperate. For his hand. For his touch. As we get into chapter 20 we're going to see some more dark things. Chapter 19 was, was pretty dark, but chapter 20 gets worse. At the beginning of chapter 20, the first seven verses, the Levite, the guy who was kind of the subject, not really the star, but the subject of chapter 19, is unnamed. And... In chapter 20, he retells the story of what happened in chapter 19. The, the only problem is, he's not, he's not limited by any, any silliness like the truth. Or what really happened. So as I read these seven verses, I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. Keep these in mind as, as we look at it. And the, the questions are simply... Um, well, what really happened in chapter 19? Is he being truthful? Who, was the, who were the victims in chapter 19? And who's the victim he makes out? Who, who is it that he makes out to be the victim as he retells the story? Did it really happen the way he said? Did he add something to the story? Did he leave something out? Verse 1 of chapter 20. Uh, excuse me, uh, not chapter. Yep, chapter 20, sorry. Then all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out as one man and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 soldiers armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, Tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah in Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house intending to kill me. They raped my concubine and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this lewd and disgraceful act in Israel. Now, you Israelites, speak up and give your verdict. Is that how it actually happened? It's okay to answer. What, what did he leave out? His part in it. And his part in it was being a coward, right? They didn't just rape his concubine. He pushed her outside, shut the door, and turned the light off and went to bed. He offered her up. What did he add to the story? They weren't trying to kill him. That's true. And he sort of made himself out to be the victim. Who was the real victim in the story? 
the concubine. There was another victim as well. That's the, the man whose house they were staying at. He had a young virgin daughter. And initially he offered up the virgin daughter. We don't know how old she was. She might have been five years old. He offered her up as well as the concubine. He wanted to make himself look as good as he could because he wanted Israel to be on his side, to see things from his perspective so that he could get their blood boiling and get them to do what he wanted, to visit vengeance on the people of the town of Gibeah. And Israel, they oblige. They are righteously indignant. And without bothering to consult God, they declare holy war against their own people. Verse 8. All the people rose up as one man, saying, None of us will go home. Not one of us will return to his house. But now, this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We'll go up against it as the, law, as the lot directs. We'll take ten men out of every hundred from all the tribes of Israel and a hundred from a, from a thousand and a thousand from ten thousand and get provisions for the army. Then when the army arrives at Gibeah and Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for all this vileness done in Israel. So all the men of Israel got together and united as one man against the city. Interesting thing here is that they came together as one man. Now, what were they doing in the land of Canaan? Joshua had died, and they as tribes were supposed to displace the Canaanites. Get rid of the false gods. Work together to accomplish what God had called them to do so that they could possess the promised land. They were never so unified. If they had been, they would have overrun the promised land as God told them to. But they didn't. What's really going on here? Remember, there's a, re a couple of reasons at least that there are no names. No one is named in chapter 19. He's just called the Levite. No one is named in chapter 19 to the end of the book. There is one name, but it has nothing to do with the story. And he is a godly man that we hear, read about in the book of Numbers named Phineas. But they're not named because this behavior, this attitude, the way they turned their backs on God was common everywhere in the nation. There are exceptions here and there, but for the most part, the whole entire nation had turned its back on God. Four times in the last five chapters, we read this entire statement or, or, or half of it. In those days, there was no king in the land, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That was the rule of the land. God was not the king on the throne of their lives or of, as a nation, and so they did whatever they wanted to do. They were not outraged because they were shocked at what the people of Gibe, the men of Gibeah did. They were well familiar with this kind of behavior. They swam, they swam in the same immoral soup. Sociologists call what they did emotional transference. Now probably the, the, the greatest, the clearest biblical example of transference is the great King David. You remember King David. He's the man after God's own heart. Wrote almost all of the Psalms. Loved God. Worshipped God with everything that he had. But his power and authority went to his head. And when he should have been off doing what kings do, he stayed home. And one evening, bored, he goes out and he stands on the top of his palace and he looks out over the city and he sees a beautiful woman taking a bath on the top of her house. He's king. Why should he deny himself anything he wants? So he sends for Bathsheba. She comes. We don't know if he forced himself on her. We don't know. Wouldn't be, out, be outside 
outside of the realm of possibility because of how he's behaving at this time. And he has sex with another man's wife. Now, that's bad. But the man whose wife he violated is one of his most trusted soldiers. He's off fighting the war that David should be at with him. And so David brings him back home. And he, and he hears how the battle's going. He wants to feed him and take good care of him and send him home so that he can sleep with his wife. And he won't do it. He stays at the king's palace and he sleeps outside with the king's servants because that's where he belongs. King David pushed it, tried to make it happen. And then, wow, then, when he saw that he couldn't do it, he wrote out in his own hand Uriah the Hittite's death warrant and he sent it back to the battle with him. And he had the man killed. Somehow, he was able to sleep at night. Not too long after that, well, it's about nine months because the baby's about to be born. No. David is um, going about his business as usual. He figured he dodged a bullet. God didn't stop anything, that didn't say anything to him. And one of his trusted advisors, a prophet named Nathan, comes in. And he tells him a story. He says, King, I, I got to tell you, this is just killing me. There's a super wealthy landowner. He's got more, more cattle, more sheep than he knows what to do with. And he's got a little neighbor. And this neighbor is just a, a, a poor crop share farmer. And he's, that, that little farmer's got a little baby ewe lamb. I mean, he loves this thing. The thing climbs up in the bed with him. He, he cares for it. It, it. He walks out from the house and the, the lamb comes and greets him at the front door. And the king had a guest come in. No, not, not the king, the wealthy landowner had a guest come in. And so he, he doesn't want to take any of his sheep. He, he gets that poor man's sheep and he slaughters it and feeds his guests and David is incensed that man deserves to die and he makes out this sentence for this guy that you are supposed to really feel like he is he is really mating out justice he's being very kingly here but what David had done was worse and what he did was he transferred his guilt on to that wealthy landowner in the story. And he was slain to the quick of his soul when Nathan said to him, You are that man. I wonder if as the Levite spun his tale, each of the leaders of Israel were incensed, righteously indignant like David, and they overreacted to their own guilty conscience. Had they been listening, would they have heard the faint whisper of God's voice? You are the man. This is you. This is what you have done. It's what's in your heart. As we peer into this story, mouth open, heart pounding, let's invite God to look deep into our hearts. Resist the tendency to transfer our guilt and shame onto the Levite and the Israelites. I would never do that. How could they do something like that? Or to 21st century abortionists, liars, thieves. Because true change begins with me. The Apostle Peter, who Tyler referred to just moments ago, he said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, Judgment begins with the house of God. What does a story like this reveal to me about me? What does it reveal to you about you? After wrestling with God last week, have you become aware of some hidden motives? In quiet moments, does your heart tremble with fear 
rather than faith? Is God putting his finger on something that he wants to heal so that he can make you stronger? Do you look at others and smile knowing that you are truly much better than them? Do you rest in your warm, comfortable home without thought of others less fortunate? I had opportunity in talking to someone this last week to remember a, a passage that has been so meaningful to me in, um, in dealing with my own issues. Proverbs 28, 13, and it won't be on the screen, but Proverbs 28, 13 says this, and as we think about where we're at, and God dealing with us in those things he may have revealed to us. I think there's great comfort here. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. But whoever confesses and repents will find mercy. Israel offered terms of peace to Gibeah. That starts in verse 12 of chapter 20. They quickly and summarily reject it. Then the battle ensues in verse 17, goes all the way through verse 48. And what we end up seeing is that Israel brought an army, 400,000 people strong, and they come together, as we've already seen, as one man, united like never before. They engage in a holy war with their own people. 65,000 soldiers on both sides are wiped out. The entire tribe of Benjamin, except for 600 soldiers, is wiped out. And those 600 soldiers, they escape into the desert. Dumbfounded, the rest of Israel, the victors, come before God. And if you listen carefully, you can hear in their words them blaming God not taking responsibility themselves for where they're at the people went to Bethel verse 2 of chapter 21 says where they sat before God until evening raising their voices and weeping bitterly O Lord the God of Israel they cried why has this happened to Israel why should one tribe be missing from Israel today and here's where it gets really bad in the aftermath of their self-determined, self-protecting, righteous indignation, they reveal the darkness in their own hearts. And they did what was right in their own eyes. They sanctioned the kidnapping and rape of hundreds of unsuspecting young Israelite women. You see, they had 600 men who needed wives. They had made a vow that none of them would let anyone of their ladies marry one of the Gibeonites. And so they, they did a survey. Were there any towns that didn't send anybody to the battle? Well, they found one. The town of Jabesh Gilead. And in chapter 21 and verse 10, this was their solution. So the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instruction to go to Jabesh Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including women and children. This is what you are to do. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. 600 escaped only found 400 they still have a problem so they realize that every year those who do still follow Yahweh have a, a worship event that they put on at a place called Shiloh in Bethel and so they say well you know what we can find 200 more and, and we're going to find them if you'll just go over to Shiloh, verse 20. So they instructed the Benjamites. Now catch this. They're telling them to do this. 
Go and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the girls of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, then rush from the vineyards, and each of you sees a wife from the girls of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, Do us a kindness by helping them, because we did not get wives for them during the war, and you are innocent since you did not give your daughters to them. So that is what the Benjamites did. While the girls were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns, and they settled in them. The book ends with all Israel returning to their inheritance, feeling all smugly contented. All was right with the world, except for one pesky little detail. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit, and God was not pleased. Jacob was forever changed when he wrestled with God, and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. To wrestle well with God is to open ourselves up for him to hurt us, to hurt us deeply sometimes, so that he may heal us completely. Because here's the truth. Until he's shown us the depth of our own lecherous hearts, he won't use us to bring healing to others. But as he heals us, bringing lasting change in us, he's equipping us to be an agent of change, a wounded healer in a world that's broken. Something really critical that we need to keep in mind is our service should not come out of our hurt. It should not come out of our pain. It's got to come out of our healing. Because if we serve out of our hurt, it's me transferring my pain onto you or whoever I'm serving. And eventually, I'm going to get burned out because that will only motivate me for so long. It can even be me making the one who hurt me pay yet again if I serve out of my pain. But serving out of my healing is taking what God has shown me, how God has cared for me, how God has healed me or is in the process of healing me, and serving others out of that healing and that health. Martin Greenfield had been violently, without regard or remorse, abused and violated. Now he stood with gun in hand, aimed at the woman's chest. In front of the beautifully grotesque representative of everything Nazi. I froze. I couldn't do it. I could not pull the trigger. That was the moment I became human again. All the old teaching came rushing back. I had been raised to believe that life was a precious gift from God. That women and children must be protected. Had I pulled the trigger, I would have been like Mengele. He too faced mothers holding babies. My mother holding my baby brother and sentenced both to gruesome deaths. My moral upbringing would not allow me to become an honorary member of the SS. Only after we're healed are we able to hear the answer to the cry of our heart. A cry that comes from broken bones that are now healed and stronger than ever. God, I know I can't do everything, but I also know that I can do something. What's my something? Throughout my life, I heard that everything happens for a reason, that God's ways are mysterious but purposeful. I believed that, but something I read decades after my showdown at the mayor of Weimer's house proved to me that in the end, in this life or the, uh, or the one after, God ultimately achieves justice. 
A friend shared with me an article from a 1945 issue of Life magazine about Nazi suicides following the war. Here's a portion of what it said. In the last days of the war, the overwhelming realization of utter defeat was too much for many Germans. Stripped of the bayonets and the bombast, which had given them power, they could not face reckoning with either their conquerors or their consciences. These found the quickest and surest escape in what Germans called Selbstmord, or self-murder. In Hitler's Reich, Germans stopped killing others and began killing themselves. In Weimar, the mayor and his wife, after seeing Buchenwald atrocities, slashed their wrists. That day in the mayor's home, God pricked my conscience, and so doing, he spared me the guilt and shame of killing the mayor of Weimar's wife. Martin Greenfield was set free by God's word that had been taught to him as a young boy. Choosing to trust God, to surrender to his word, to listen to what he says, allowed God to heal Martin's heart. To reconcile him with the hurt and the indignation and humiliation that he had undergone. So that he could live a full life not in spite of his scars, but because of his scars. When we release our righteous indignation and listen to God's word, we trust him to right the scales of justice and he sets us free. And we experience God's healing in our lives. He replaces our brokenness with health, allowing us to look at the brokenness around us with eyes of compassion. Because when we look at someone, even someone who's hurt us, we're not looking at the enemy, we're looking at someone who's been duped by the enemy. That doesn't mean that we just ignore the hurt. We have to deal with it. We have to look at it full on. I'm not downplaying the pain that you might have experienced in your life. But I am saying that let's bring it to God and let's allow Him to answer our questions. Where were you, God, when I was going through this? Why did you allow it to happen? Let Him meet us at our point of greatest pain so that He can bring health and healing there so that we can ask on the other side not in spite of our pain but because of our pain God what's my something you can't do everything but you can do something what's your something maybe like Israel you've been living as you see fit and God's been showing that to you. And the something for you is to say, God, forgive me. I'm turning away from that and I'm turning to you. We call that repentance. I'm going to yield my life to you. I'm going to offer myself to you. Maybe your something is to bring your hurt to God and let him heal you. Maybe, maybe you've been healed. And you've kind of kept it to yourself. And there's a way that God wants you to use that hurt to benefit other people. You see, we believe as a church that God has called us to be a force for God's grace in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Well, the only way we can be forces as a congregation, a force of God's grace, is if we as individuals choose to serve out of our pain. And to be a force for God's grace. Could it be that God is calling you to be somehow using what he's poured into your life and the healing he's given you? We're all s separate individuals. We each come here with different things that have been going on in our lives. Some are similar and some are very unique. But I believe God is speaking to each one of us. 
And the question I want for each of us to consider is, God, what's my something? Let's pray together. God, we are humbled and, and blown away by your goodness. You can even take a horrible situation and you can bring beauty from it. And you don't, you don't disregard the pain that we feel. You, you are right there in the middle of it with us. And you continue to remind us that you love us. That you're there for us. That you will meet our every need if we will simply come to you. God, we, we want to show the world who you are. Help us to experience your healing so that we can be free to love as you do. In Jesus' name.